and welcome to the CDO Magazine interview series. My name is Patrick Martin with Lingaro. I'm a business development manager. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with Ross Shelmo from General Electric. Ross is the Senior Director of Data and, and Analytics. Ross, it's very good to speak with you again. Nice to speak with you too, Patrick. Very good. I um, Obviously, you have an extremely impressive background. Um, you've done a lot of things in, um, I say a short matter of time because you're younger than me, but uh, <laughs> you have a lot of experience. How has your background and um, job experiences prepared you uh, for the role that you currently have within General Electric? Yeah, um, it, I, you know, I've been fortunate enough uh, for the past six years to be in a data analytics space. Uh, but interestingly, I'd say most of my past experiences uh, didn't really position me for the role specifically. Um, so prior to data, my role is focused on client and network security, uh, then private cloud deployment. So, you know, very heavy infrastructure background. Um, those roles allow me to learn and grow into various technology disciplines, uh, as well as learning how to lead people. So I was fortunate enough to progress into being a, a manager during that time. Um, but I found data to be just a largely different animal in many ways. Uh, in, in my experience, um, you know, being a successful leader anywhere, regardless of background, means being humble enough to know that uh, you won't know everything coming in, um, being persistent and insistent on learning and empowering your people to guide you along the way is kind of what I found to be the most successful thing in coming up to speed um, and like really empowering the team to guide you along the way. Um, so the past six years within data have been just amazing for my personal and professional growth um, in general and with respect to data. Uh, everyone's got to start somewhere. So really, I'd say it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a background in data to be successful in data. Really, a lot of those common leadership traits of just, again, being willing and persistent in learning, coming up to speed, uh, that's the most valuable thing. Uh, having said all that, uh, again, I just, I love everything about data. Uh, I, I couldn't have envisioned this being where I'd wind up in my career. I had always envisioned uh, staying more technical, architecture focused, uh, but getting a, a sense of leadership, getting into data and seeing how that can transform a business. I've just loved everything about it, um, both the technology as well as how you get an aspect of that business process and being able to change business through the power of data. Uh, it's been just uh, an awesome, humbling experience for me. Excellent. Yeah, you very enthusiastic about it. And um, that I'm sure your team appreciates that very, very much. Um, Next question. It's uh, generally acknowledged that the pace of change is very rapid in the data world. Um, and a lot of times it requires working with external uh, partners, whether those are software, technology, or service partners. How do you identify and um, develop relationships with these partners? Yeah, um, I love using our example of our self-service program uh, to answer this question. Uh, so back in what, 2016, uh, we actually tried to start a self-service program uh, and on a whim, and it failed spectacularly. Uh, so uh, among the reasons is we were trying something uh, because a vendor reached out to us, not because we really had a, a stated need. So we, you know, it's innovative and we want to try something new, uh, but we were really trying to force technology on folks that weren't exactly asking for it, maybe even ready for it. Um, so both our approach and the vendor were really nascent in our maturity, and that didn't help things. So it failed, and we mothballed the idea. Um, fast forward to even just a year later, uh, our data analytics execution program that, uh, that I was leading was really starting to get its footing. Uh, we'd grown from nothing into eight global execution scrum teams and really started to realize at that point that we were not going to be able to scale as quickly as the appetite for you know, data was growing in the business. Um, so... At that point, um, I turned to someone on my team, John Tudor, who's just a phenomenal individual, uh, to, to look at self-service again and really challenge with the mindset of using a design thinking approach. So instead of just looking at tools and technologies, uh, what we did was really survey the landscape, you know, leverage Gartner just to see who all were players in the space, uh, looked at about 70 different tools and companies, um, had conversations with about 35 of them, and then narrowed down to actually doing a simultaneous bake-off with five vendors at the same time for seven sets of use cases. But the key was we actually had the business doing those POCs and bake-offs with us. So we had out of seven teams, one IT team working on a solution, six others from the business because we were driving a self-service program. Our thought was really, 
Like we can select a tool, but wouldn't it be really cool if the business just told us what they were going to use and then we just invested everything in doing that? Uh, it wound up in not selecting the cheapest technology by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but we knew going into it, like the business already told us that they would use it and they would love to continue using it. Um, so that mindset and that approach really also just got instant buy-in because then there's this sense of ownership uh, from, from getting into the business. And, and specifically, uh, the vendor, I, I can't say enough about Data IQ specifically. Um, they were really, truly, I know this is overused, they truly felt like partners. They, they understood, along with Alation, um, they understood how committed we were because of this process that we went through. And even during that pilot phase, uh, they got to know our business process, our use cases, so they can kind of co-develop and see where we're trying to head. Uh, I don't know if that is a repeatable formula for success everywhere because those companies, of course, have since grown tremendously because they're phenomenal companies, but they were younger in their maturity. We were just starting off. We almost got to grow up together. Uh, and I honestly view both of them as huge partners. Like, I, I never feel like I'm being sold something. It's truly, hey, how can we help? Hey, how can we talk to some of your clients as well and understand what they're doing, uh, help with benchmarking? So from there, we've grown that program from nothingness into over 2,000 unique users in the business using our tools and platforms. Uh, Alation's evolved from uh, being just a data catalog, which we brought it in for, into the backbone of our data governance program. Data IQ evolved from just being a self-service tool into our analytic invention platform. And it's really through that partnership and trust that we form with those, not just technologies, but the, the providers. Again, I can't say that that it has expanded into every uh, vendor relationship that we have, and, and not everyone needs it. But I feel like if you get lucky enough to catch uh, a particular supplier, partner, vendor, call it what you will at the right time, you really feel like it's an, it's an extension of your family and not someone trying to sell you something. Yes. So as a, a data executive, you, know, you have to establish the, the strategy and the vision, but you also have to deliver. How do you balance the, the strategic piece with the tactical? Um, what sort of things do you do, like maybe proof of concepts or things like that? Yes. Uh, and in fact, I'm a big fan of POCs for a purpose is what we like to say. So innovation for innovation's sake can, can be useful, uh, especially for personal technical development. Um, but without a goal in mind, I find that those have usually fizzled out before they get off the ground even. So even if it's a simple problem statement of something like uh, prove out how we can achieve ACID data compliance on S3, and then having your team research technologies, implement a POC, and share the results, the learnings from that uh, will get you something in your organization, even if that learning is just, hey, this didn't work. As long as you're sharing that, that is a very useful outcome. Um, so I always like to have that mentality, uh, and we use that for our next generation Day Lake ecosystem uh, that we're hosting in AWS. So we've, we've allowed anyone to get access to our AWS environment uh, to do experimentation. Again, they, they can do whatever they want in the interest of learning. If uh, they do want to take something into our no, even non-prod ecosystem, they have to at least share what goals were they trying to achieve, uh, think the tools and techniques that they used to solve it, and then how successful were they in achieving those goals. And then based on that, there's some documented learnings and the ability to progress into this makes sense to build as a use case. Uh, we try not to have it as a layer of bureaucracy, but more just as a, hey, you maybe don't need to solve this thing that already has been solved in the exact same way. Uh, if you're trying to solve it in a better, faster, cheaper way, that piece, that's awesome and you can progress in. Uh, but we really want to take this opportunity to promote learning as well as progressing things for a real business benefit and, and not just to facilitate uh, you know, someone growing their own personal skills. There's a place for that, uh, but there's a stronger place for those purposeful POCs that progress our use cases forward uh, to a defined endpoint. Very good. Switching gears just a little bit, um, I know that uh, networking is important and I'm sure that um, we've talked that we've, we know some folks in common. How important mm -hmm. is networking with not only folks within your organization, but outside of your organization. And what are some of the, the things that you do to network? I may be a bit contrary here. I don't know if I'll regret saying it. Honestly, I don't know if it's that important for success, 
Um, what I mean, and what I mean by that is networking, I think, can help you get successful faster, absolutely, um, whether it's leveraging practices or learning what didn't work. Um, those aren't necessarily prerequisites for success. Um, so I've, I've found much more practically useful, I, and I think you hit it, networking within my own company has been extremely useful um, and really not just to learn best practices, but even thinking on the business side, those relationships are what's so hugely important. Um, being able to build, again, uh, a personal bond with someone. So again, as much as I want to not feel like I'm being sold something from external vendors, my business partners don't want me to sell an IT solution without even understanding what their business problems are. Uh, so that is the aspect of networking that I really, really feel is critical to success within a company. And again, yes, you can accelerate. And we have several instances where I'll use Alation again. Um, you know, we ask them as we're starting our data governance program, hey, who are some of your customers that have really done it well? And we've asked them to facilitate some meetings and we've met some incredible folks along the way. Um, and that, that is in the technology realm and it's extremely useful. Uh, I still feel like the biggest benefit from some of that networking is within your own company, within your own team, to be able to build those relationships that just make it easier to have a, understand a common goal and work together toward that goal. Um, have, again, having said that, I, I mentioned a couple of the examples. Um, I'm, I like the promise of the Cincinnati chapter of the CDO forum. Uh, it, you know, I would, if nothing else, a much more cost-effective and convenient way to meet people in the same situations as you as going to something like a Strata conference. Uh, but of course, once COVID's over, I'd still like to go to Strata Conference as well. <laughs> I think you're right on. I mean, building trust in relationships um, is is critical, and um, definitely, and it does help as you're trying to get buy-in without trying to sell. Um, mm. I completely agree with you on that. So your role is a very transformational role, um, and that term transformational gets thrown around a lot. And has a lot of different meanings. What does it mean to you and General Electric? Yeah, um, we have several things that we've uh, termed as transformation, all accurate. Uh, we've, went th we've gone through a agile transformation with how we execute. We've gone through a digital transformation. Even with just with respect to data, we've probably actually already gone through several uh, iterations of what I would call um, those transformations. So when we first started our data lake program back in 2015, um, that was aimed largely at enabling our data scientist community specifically to solve problems that would take months to solve with disparate manual data extracts, data everywhere. So the term data lake and its applications started to enter into that common vernacular, even at the business level. Uh, we were fortunate enough that our CEO uh, of aviation was a big sponsor of that. Um, so while it wasn't ubiquitous, um, I'd associate kind of that phase with an early form of data literacy transformation that we went through. Um, and then from there, we went through, I think, what the industry would probably now call is data democratization through the explosion of our self-service program. Uh, so once our data lake achieved a critical mass of data, we had this perfect storm of hype and the uh, practical applications and ability to meet that hype uh, that resulted in uh, just data availability unlike anything the business has ever seen. And uh, it coupled with a growing program aimed at identifying the most useful data sets, uh, you know, developed by IT and the business and promoting them for reuse. Uh, we had more people working with good data than ever before. And then now, that really the transformation I'm most excited about is this next phase we're entering, entering into, and we're calling it internally this enterprise data strategy. So at its core, it centers around the premise that if you can identify the best data in your company, acquire, curate, and stage it in a, you know, a flexible technology architecture that matches technology capability to consumption patterns uh, while governing as an accelerant for consuming data as opposed to a speed bump. You've got this foundation uh, to support a modern enterprise architecture uh, that can grow and change as fast as your business does. So uh, this is going to be a, another huge undertaking, another literal transformation that we haven't seen before because uh, it doesn't combine just technology. It's technology, it's business process, it's data stewardship, it's information management, it, it's enterprise architecture, and as a combined strategy versus being run as independent efforts. So, you know, if, if I think of data democratization as the practice of making data available to everyone, uh, not to be too corny about it, I would call this like trusted data democratization. So that's the process of making good data, not only accessible, but dependable for everyone. Uh, and that's the space that we're entering, entering into now. So return on investment is always important for any project or initiative. Um, how do you quantify value 
and attribute success. I mean, we've talked about this before, but you know, defining the the key success factors up front along with the business is important. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, uh, luckily, uh, we have a relatively simple system now that we've evolved into. This is not true. I'll get to the evolution. Uh, but we used to approximate value, which is simply clicks. So uh, ha- can we identify who, whether that's a person or an application, and how often are folks consuming your solutions? So you know, we'll, we'll highlight major applications that have driven benefits from our ecosystem, um, but attributing the percentage of those benefits to what you, your data ecosystem did versus an application that's consuming it versus the users that are using that application to change your business process, that is nearly impossible to do accurately or fairly. Um, so early on, we did, we did try that. So we, we didn't go to the extent of ever trying to say this much specifically was attributed to Data Lake. Um, we, we went with a process of digitally enabled benefits. So if someone had a $100 million program, we took a swag and said, hey, if they enable that through the data lake, can we say that 30% of it, just making up a number, was digitally enabled? And then you ascribe those benefits to, to that ecosystem. That has some advantages. I mean, it's very simple and straightforward. Um, the problems are you can really mask some things that aren't working well. If you just say everything is 30%, like how do you know what's not working then out of that? Uh, so we've evolved into a less financially backed model, but I feel like a pretty good representation of if folks are using your tools and you can show that, you know, you're reaching whatever that entitlement level is, uh, you're at least on the right track. And it's tough to argue, like uh, I'll go back to our self-service example. It's tough to argue that the business keeps asking for more growth. There, there's already some implicit perceived benefit that they're getting from that program. Uh, so we found that to be a fairly straightforward way to communicate the benefits. Uh, the only thing I will say is uh, one thing in this vein that we've started to do uh, more recently to help highlight some of those benefits uh, is we, we you know, kind of gamify the system a little bit. So out of our self-service program, we have this uh, self-service all-stars program and quarterly we'll let folks self-nominate and share what they've done within this data ecosystem. And it, it does two things. Uh, it allows us to stay close and engaged with our, our consumers, whether that's business or IT. And, you know, selfishly in the back end, uh, we get some really, really cool highlights. Uh, even last year alone, um, hundreds of millions of self-stated benefits that, again, not, I would never pretend all of that is attributed to what we have done centrally, but it's still really cool to add up the value of, regardless of how they got there, um, they decided to take the time to nominate themselves as part of this self-service program to say, my accomplishment was enabled by this ecosystem. So a combination of, of those uh, kind of success stories plus clicks is really just the straight, sim- simple way that we try to convey value back to the biz- business. And what a great way for the, the organization to share best practices. And uh, I mean, it's just everybody gets better. That's, that's a great idea. Wow. Absolutely. So obviously people are critical for success as well. And um, what is your secret to recruiting and equally important retaining top level talent? Yeah, um, for starters, um, avoiding another global pandemic that restricts air travel is, is near the top of my list at this point. Um, <laughs> beyond that, um, you know, the, honestly, the problems that we're fortunate enough to work on in GE Aviation, um, we're, we're lucky sometimes speak for themselves. They're rooted in, in problem statements that everyone can understand, uh, getting people to where they need to go safely. And enabling that in our environment uh, means working with, uh, you know, within a data lake ecosystem, with petabytes of data. It means being able to trace an issue in the field back to how an engine was serviced or assembled or manufactured or sourced or designed. And then being able to understand where that root cause is and trace that back up to other engines in the field that may have the same factors. So how do you get into preventing issues from happening in the field or predicting them before they even happen? Um, And then the technologies and languages that we need to use are modern and not just for the sake of being modern, but because we, we know that historical legacy technologies and approaches just don't work at the scale that we need them to. Uh, So we continue to give our people challenging problems to solve Um, on the personal side, helping them understand things like what a career path means within it, within data. So how do you progress from being an analyst to an engineer to an architect to maybe now you want to become a principal technologist or maybe a people leader 
or maybe you want to, you're really interested in the product side of things. So you hop into product ownership. Um, and then lastly, I'd say being very intentional on curating and promoting uh, a culture of innovation, teamwork, and, and really getting the job done, but also having a focus on enjoying what you do along the way. Those are the things like more than titles, uh, money, those things are important. That's what we found really keeps people here. Um, and we're living through it right now where, where folks absolutely could uh, be looking at other areas given the challenges that GE Aviation is going through this environment. Uh, and, and yet, for the most part, uh, our people are engaged. Uh, they're looking forward to the future because I think they see this foundation that we have where we, we can build back even stronger than we were before. Very good. You've kind of touched on this, but just wanted to ask directly was, how does your, what, what's your management style like? How do you motivate and engage your team? Yeah. So I'll, I'll paraphrase. Um, I'm, I'll build on the culture piece I just mentioned a bit, but uh, a personal mantra I've adopted from a former coworker is uh, to be, I'll be more PC about it than she was, but you can get your uh, stuff done to be miserable or you can get your stuff done and, and have fun. And that's really more of the, of the mantra I try to have. Um, so I, but, but I believe they come in that order. So setting high standards, ultimately, I feel like is rewarded when your people grow to achieve them and have to stretch to get there um, versus setting the bar you know, low enough that uh, everyone feels like they, they delivered something when in the back of their minds, like maybe they're not getting stretched and challenged enough. They, they need to progress in their careers. Um, cultivating trust is a huge focus of mine. Um, I continually try to let my team know through multiple mechanisms that I will always have their backs when it comes to making a decision, uh, especially that it aligns to when it aligns to our larger strategy. Um, I try to speak openly and honestly about development areas, and I'll happily take anyone up on the opportunity to be a mentor and in whatever way I can kind of coach them through whatever they're feeling, whether they report to me or whether they're in different organizations. And uh, I'll say it helps. Uh, for me, particularly, if you can not only tolerate but appreciate my dad jokes, because I, I am a, a father of three and a master of them. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so, what's been the biggest challenge uh, you've encountered in your role? Is, has it been people, process, or technology, or combination? Always people. Uh, <laughs> Um, I've been, and sometimes still am, actually guilty of uh, identifying a strategy, circulating with a few folks on my team once or twice, and then assuming there's a, this universal understanding and embracing of, uh, of ideas. And it, it just never works like that. Um, that's where those relationships that I mentioned previously within your company, even if it's really painful for an introvert like me, uh, and sometimes it truly is, um, it's critical to success. Uh, you have to have those relationships. So our biggest struggle right now is getting the business to see the need for things like active data stewardship and ownership as part of our governance strategy. Um, so you can have all the tools in the world to track, you know, metadata throughout a data set, data assets lifecycle. Um, but if the business doesn't see value in practices like defining and tagging the data, then like, what's the point? Uh, so we've attempted top-down approaches with executives in the business uh, with some success only to have then you know, those executives uh, move on to different roles. And then it's almost like you start from scratch at that point. Uh, we've also tried the same bottoms up approach that we did with our self-service program. Um, but it, it's interesting with self-service, it's, it's almost a different mindset because you're enabling people to do what they want to do faster. That's not always the case, what we're asking with governance. It's not that everyone wants to take the time to describe and define data extremely well. So you're asking folks to do something they might not want to do. And getting over that hump to, under, to convince them why it's important, um, that's what's been most profoundly difficult. Uh, so again, I'd be surprised if anyone tells you it's something other than that. I feel like people, that's where you have the greatest opportunity, but just naturally, that's where you have the greatest struggle. One last question here. Um, you mentioned it earlier about the pandemic and mm -hmm. uh, the impact, certainly in your industry. Um, how has it impacted your priorities? <laughs> You had to shift any gears because of this impact. Yeah, it, it, uh, not to be cliche, it's probably easier to discuss the priorities that haven't changed since the pandemic hit. Um, and really, aside from keeping security and compliance at the forefront of everything we do, uh, we've had to make major sacrifices in, I mean, nearly every key initiative that we're trying to drive across the board. Um, and somehow, mostly because I have a ridiculously talented team, and I'm so fortunate to have them, uh, we've managed to make some major strides in those key areas despite that. Um, and it, 
it really has allowed us, I think, at this time to take advantage of, as much as you can say that, the pandemic to reinforce within the business the need for things like operational stability. So uh, really pushing back hard on things like new feature development in the form of can we address technical debt and reestablish that strong foundation to build from again and, and take the time to be a little bit selfish about it um, be, because we know we're gonna, we, there's that urge to get right back into developing features and, and we are trying to make sure we're not being asked to do more with less, but to do less with less and really focus on what is critical to, to keep going at this point. Um, that hasn't prevented us from being asked to do more things. And, and interestingly, one of those things is actually responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, especially in the uh, aviation industry. Um, so that's resulted in some more priorities as, as we look to scale back costs in certain areas. But we're being asked to develop new solutions uh, that help project how our industry and our company specifically um, might recover throughout various models, you know, taking in external data factors, some internal proprietary algorithms to look at, um, again, just different recovery curves and models. How does passenger spend now reflect to a recovery timeline at some point in the future? How does that translate into when some of our airlines might actually start putting their engines through shop visits again, which is how we make a lot of our money? Um, that has been, as much as it's additional work, and it's, it's caused some long hours and late nights for individuals on the team to put those things together. To see that direct impact in the business, uh, and that direct impact is felt our aviation and overall GE CEOs look at these reports on a daily basis to understand that data. That has been uh, just really cool to see, and I'm incredibly proud of my team and, and actually overall GE Aviation to see how we've responded during this pandemic. And uh, it's convinced me now more than ever, we've got a bright future ahead of us. That's great. And that's got to be exciting to be providing that data and that those analytics that can, can basically help your company be super successful. So it's not every day that, uh, you know, look, we're, we're data engineers, data architects behind this behind the scenes sometimes. So there isn't always that opportunity for the limelight. Um, this has been a really cool opportunity to have our team step up and get some of that exposure into the great work that we're doing and how it's changing the course of the overall company and like have it reflected when you know Larry Culp references this data to know it's something that our teams have developed uh, is a really really cool feeling for both myself and our teams. Very good. Well, Ross thank you so much for your time today it's been extremely informative and uh, wow <laughs> sounds like you have quite an organization and uh, I like how you said that you guys like to have fun um, it does make a difference um, especially when the challenges are tough. So hugely, thank you again for your time. And uh, for those that are watching, be sure to check out cdomagazine.tech for additional interviews and have a great day. Thanks, Patrick.